So in this episode of PKB Inspire, I'm going to share with you very important uh, principles for uh, entrepreneurs. Have you ever thought about your supply chain as an entrepreneur? Supply chain management is absolutely crucial for you to succeed. Every production happens at a location and that location, which is called the point of production, we need to find a way to get those products to the point of consumption. In other words, your product is produced at a specific location and your customers are definitely located at different locations. So the pivotal discussion that we need to have around entrepreneurship is mainly about distribution. In other words, how do you get your product from the point of production to the point of consumption? But mind you, before you can deliver any product, there has to be some form of demand. So we always say in the field of supply chain management that the demand triggers activities of the supply chain. So in this episode of PKB Inspire, I'm going to share with you two essential topics that every entrepreneur needs to look at distribution and sales. These are absolutely crucial for you to deliver whatever product or services that you intend for your customers. Stay tuned. In order for you to understand your distribution network and to deliver value to you, your end consumer, you first need to understand what really is a supply chain. An understanding of the supply chain is what leads to the discussions around the value chain. So what really is the supply chain? The supply chain, simply put, is basically a connection or the interconnectedness between your suppliers, between manufacturers, between um, distributors, distribution uh, centers, um, between your warehouses, and eventually to the customer or the market that is in need of your product. So think of it this way, that for any product that is delivered to the customer, that product has to be manufactured. Now, after the manufacture of that product, this product has to be transported. In other words, moved from the actual manufacturing plant to, um, in most instances, a distribution center or a warehouse for storage. Remember that I mentioned in the introduction that the demand from the market is what triggers activities in the supply chain. So in order for demand to be met, products would have to be available all year round. And this is why a lot of um, products that you see online are almost always available because the products are stored after manufacturing. So you have either warehouses or distribution centers. In some cases, we have what we call drop shipment, where the manufacturing plant delivers directly the product to the market based on the demand. So you need to first understand your supply chain. Who are your suppliers? What is the capacity of your suppliers? Who are your suppliers' suppliers? In other words, you need to understand the raw material availability that is required for the production of your product. So if you're someone who produces, for example, a mobile phone, if we take an example of Apple, Apple would look at um, Foxconn for manufacturing, will look to Foxconn for their manufacturing needs. So you know, Apple does not do the actual manufacturing. They have manufacturers, um, especially in China, their biggest in China. Now that manufacturer also depends on um, external suppliers for the raw materials for production. So before Apple can determine the price of the, uh, the latest iPhone, they will need to understand their supply chain. What is the availability of batteries, for example? What is the availability of LED screens? What is the availability of the components that goes into the iPhone? What is the manufacturing capacity of Foxconn to deliver? And then, okay, Apple says we have um, a launch date for say 1st of July. Now the question therefore would be, how soon can we manufacture and pre-ship all these products to warehouses or distribution centers so that on the 1st of July, any customer who has pre-ordered 
would have their iPhones delivered. Now, that is really, you know, like a global company. But if you look at yourself, you're someone who produces juices, for example. You go to the market to buy the fruit that goes into producing the juice. Remember that the, the market woman who is selling you the fruit does not produce those fruits. She also depends on a farmer in a village somewhere. In fact, in most instances, the market woman who is selling the fruit <laughs> depends on you know, an, a, another um, supplier who in most cases would go to the farms in the villages to consolidate the fruits and bring them to you know, the bigger markets. So that is your supply chain. You go to the market, you have a specific market woman you buy your fruits from. She also depends on another supplier who goes to the, the farmers to consolidate the fruits. And even the farmer also depends on, you know, another supplier, you know, for the seedlings and for the insecticides, the fertilizers. All these go into the production or the planting of fruits. So the farmer also depends on the supp another supplier. So this is what we refer to as the supplier supplier. So that is your supply chain. You you so after you buy the fruits from the market woman, you come home. And let's say you have, you have a small production at home. You put the fruits together. You have a blender, you have a cooler, and you have a strainer to strain out, you know, all, all the rough edges and so forth. So you do the production. So in this case, you are the production entity. So you do the production at home. You do the bottling at home. You do the sealing, you do the packaging and so forth at home. Remember your customers are not at home or in your house. Your customers are elsewhere. So from your point of production, you need to find a way to deliver whatever you have packaged or, bot or bottled to the customer. So you have orders coming from all over the place. So if you are based in Ghana, it means that you can have orders coming from Tema, you can have orders coming from Accra, you can have orders coming from Kumase and so forth. Now these orders that are coming in is what we call the demand generation component of your supply chain. It is these orders that give you an idea of how much fruit you have to buy from the market woman. So this is why we say that the demand triggers activities in your supply chain. So if you are the person making the fruit juice, this is your supply chain. Those demands that are coming is what triggers, gives you an idea of how much fruit you need to buy. All right. It, it, it even gives you an idea of how much sales you should expect by way of forecasting potential future demand. Now, the other component is that because of the low shelf life of your fruit juice, you know, you want to keep your fruit juice really fresh all the time. And so you have a very low shelf life. What do I mean by shelf life? Um, basically after production, how long can your product be stored uh, before it goes bad? Before you know, it becomes, it goes rancid or before it's not uh, wholesome to be consumed by a, a customer. Because you're into the food juice, you need to understand your distribution. How do I ensure that based on the demand patterns I'm seeing from the market, how do I produce the right quantity such that I don't overproduce or underproduce? The implication of overproducing is that you would have a lot more product than there is demand. So you will be able to fulfill the demand out there, but you have a chunk of product sitting um, in your fridge or in your warehouse or wherever you store your product at home. It means that the low shelf life will be impacted. It means you have to destroy those products because they will no longer be wholesome for consumption or you would have to give them you know, away for free, which eventually will be locked up capital you know, as a small startup. The implication of underproducing is that you would have disgruntled customers. So customers who place an order would not have enough products to you know, be delivered to them. What that means is that your service level, your customers would move to your competitor or would be would leave negative reviews on your website and on your social media platforms. So this basically explains the supply chain and the distribution network you know, of someone who produces juice at home. Question is, how do you ensure that the demand that is coming is well monitored and 
that demand informs you adequately for you to go to the market woman and buy the right amount of fruit for production. This brings us to the next topic of demand forecasting. So in order to understand your demand forecasting, it's essential to understand these two principles. Your supply chain or your business model would either be a demand pool supply chain model or a supply push supply chain model. Let me explain these two. In the demand pool supply chain model, basically you only produce based on firm customer orders. So you have customers who would place an order and based on either a purchase order or a firm order, you then trigger your production process. So in this case with a fruit juice company, the example is that you receive an order from Accra of 2000 bottles of your fruit juice. Based on that firm order, you go to the market, to the market woman and buy the right amount of fruits that would go into the production of those 200 bottles of fruit juice. Now this you would have already explained to the customer that based on this order, you should expect the order to be delivered in two weeks. That is what in supply chain we call the lead time. So the lead time really is basically the difference between when that order is coming in and when you'll be able to fulfill or deliver that order. So we've talked about the demand pool. So the demand really is what is triggering your uh, purchasing, your manufacturing um, process in your supply chain. And then we have what we call the supply push. So the supply push is based mainly on forecast. So it's not based on firm order. So let me give you a typical example. In this fruit juice company that we are referring to, let's say that you as the founder or CEO, you have historic data of demand patterns. So you tell yourself that, okay, over the past three years, I usually get maybe 5,000 uh, bottles of juice orders, you know, from, from Kumase around June to August. And then in Tamale, usually around this season, the season of June, July, I get another 20,000 bottles and so forth. Now, based on this historic data, you can do some form of extrapolation, what we call forecasting. You can therefore say that, okay, I'll be expecting you know, X amount of bottles to come in as orders. Now, based on that expectation of future demand, you proactively, you know, produce whatever it is that you have to produce and then deliver to or the retail um, shops that carry your product. So in the supply push, you don't wait till you have a firm purchase order or a firm order, but you produce based on forecast. And that forecast, the accuracy of that forecast would determine well, whether or not you know you have products being returned to you as, as a company. So these two supply chain strategies are important. Demand pull or supply push. In demand pull, I said that the purchase order is firm, the order is firm, it is confirmed, the customer has confirmed the order. And based on that, you go to the market to buy the raw materials to produce and whatever it is you need to produce. But in the supply push, you are looking at you producing based on forecast. So there's no firm order, but then you produce based on forecast. Now, coming back to understanding demand patterns, if you are into producing fruit juice, the question with a low shelf life, the question therefore is which one of these two supply chain strategies, for example, is going to be ideal for your company? Think about it. Would you have to use a demand pool supply chain model or you would use a supply push supply chain model? Think about it. So I guess you've had time to think about it. Now, it will all depend on your go-to market model. In other words, how have you predetermined as a company to deliver your products to your customers. So if you are, for example, having some form of distribution arrangement with distributors in a very volatile market 
where the demand pattern is quite sporadic and the demand pattern is quite unpredictable then of course you cannot use a supply push so the market condition based on the demand patterns if the demand uh, is volatile and the market is quite volatile and unpredictable then you would have to use um, a demand pool in other words you wait till your retailers send you the actual um, purchase orders and then you you know, trigger activities in your supply chain, the manufacturing, the procurement of raw materials and, and assembling and packaging and so forth to deliver. Um, the disadvantage with this go-to-market model or this supply chain model of demand pool is that you, you end up having quite long lead times. Remember I spoke about lead times earlier. The lead time would be longer because you only begin activities in your supply chain only when you have received a firm purchase order. The advantage is that, you know, this is kind of galvanizes your sales. You know very well that once a purchase order has come in, it is a firm order. It is confirmed their sales recognition. And then there's a quite a minimal level of risk as far as, you know, delivering the product is concerned. The only thing is you have long lead time. So again, with this fruit juice company, if you wait till you get your order, it means that now you, are, you, you now have to go to the market. And what if you go to the market and if the, the customer, let's say, ordered for grape juice and due to seasonality you know, conditions, the market woman hasn't got grapes at the time, right? So you have to wait longer or they don't have enough grapes you know, on the market. So then you have to source from other market women who don't have the supply relationship with you. So you may have to you know, buy those grapes at a higher price. So that is one thing you need to understand when you choose the demand pool kind of supply chain model. The second model, um, again, for this same juice company could be a supply push, you know, depending. For example, if the market um, demand is quite predictable. You know very well, looking at your historic data, you have done a bit of analysis to understand the, the patterns, the demand patterns. You have quite um, a strong uh, confidence in the market. Then you could use uh, this supply push. Normally for bigger companies, they use this supply push when they have uh, an affiliate business. So when there's a subsidiary of the company you know, in, in, the, in the market. So it's more or less selling the product to its subsidiary. It's easier, you know, you know that it's, it's more galvanized, sales is still galvanized and kept within the company normally. But for a small company like the juice company that we are using as a case study, you could still use the supply push if you know your retailers and your distributors are trustworthy. The demand pattern can be relied on. You know for sure that around Christmas, there's high demand of 50,000 bottles minimum. Then you can anticipate, you know, so you can already talk to your suppliers and your suppliers will also speak with your suppliers ahead of time. The advantage with this is that you be um, supplying, you know, the uh, product in huge quantities. Um, because you are you are sure um, that the pattern that you are seeing is going to reoccur, um, you are able to negotiate. You know, economies of scale. You are able to negotiate with a market woman for you know bigger um, volumes in order to cut down on the total cost of production. You are also able to um, establish a better supplier relationship. What your suppliers want is that they are able to supply because you're they are, remember they are also doing business so they want a more regular you know, demand coming from you they want to also see some uh, orders coming from you and if that order is regular then you're able to establish a more meaningful relationship supplier relationship with these uh, suppliers that you have but imagine that you only let's say go to your suppliers when there's a firm order you know they you you would not be their most liked you know um, customer or client because your orders will be quite sporadic and quite unpredictable so then you know it does not help so if you are using the supply push model you're able to establish a more meaningful long-term relationship with your suppliers and you're able to get the advantage of economies of scale the disadvantage with this model of supply push you know, for this fruit juice company is that 
you run the risk of shelf life topics, right? So <laughs> if you have a fruit juice and um, you know, shelf life is seven days or 10 days or whatever it is, and you are just supplying based on forecast, what if that forecast or pattern that you have observed does not reoccur? So what that means is you are unable to recall the product. In most instances, you have to destroy the product. So there's loss of revenue, number one. Secondly, you would have to destroy the product. So there's the destruction cost as well. And in some markets, you can't just destroy these products. You need to pay some fine for the authorities to supervise the destruction of those products. So eventually, you're going to spend a lot more money getting rid of those products that you're unable to sell. At the same time, you would have lost revenue. So these are the pros and cons when you're considering what is the best supply chain model for your product, for your company, and for your distribution network. So to wrap up this episode, thinking about your distribution network, we've talked about the fact that your distribution basically is your supply chain and your supply chain model can either be the demand pool supply chain model or the supply push supply chain model. We've also talked about the pros and cons of each of these models. These models will eventually determine how you're able to deliver your product from the point of production to the point of consumption. Remember, that all the activities of your supply chain is supposed to deliver value to the end user. And this is why we call it your value chain. So your supplier being able to supply the raw materials uh, in the right quality to your facility and you being able to put those raw materials together for the manufacturing process and being able to um, distribute their products from your facility you know, to either a warehouse or a distribution center and eventually to the retail stores for the customers to buy and consume. All the activities in your supply chain has to add value. And this is why we call it a value chain. So ensure that your supply chain is actually a value chain, that there are no um, aspects of your supply chain that takes away value to the final customer. I do hope that this episode of PKB Inspire has been valuable to you. Think about your demand or your sales and your distribution. Your distribution is basically your supply chain. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave a comment in the comment section below. I'll catch you in the next one.